prevails us. Well, as soon as you start, the more interesting it becomes. The lady in the uh, doorstep tells, okay, uh, we'll be advertising our session in here. All right, dear colleagues, my name is Alexander Pakhomov. I'm the member of the Management Board General Counsel GSC Inter Rao. It's a pleasure to welcome you to an annual roundtable uh, on the on energy. This year, we decided to focus not on the problems of specifically Russian energy industry, but we decided to talk more about the harmonization between various legislations, and namely European Union, Russia, and we'll talk about this new um, this 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 new form of cooperation, the the new union between Russia, Belarus and other countries, the European Eurasian Union, e -E -U. and we'll also talk about um, the ways of harmonizing legislation in the field of energy, and uh, let me introduce you the speakers for today. Uh, they will cover this topic. Uh, Bernd Meiring, a partner from Linklater's LLP. Nikolai Mizulin, a partner from Meyer Brown LLP, both gentlemen represent Brussels. Brussels. Uh, Viktor Miesnik, uh, the director of the Energy Department, Eurasian Economic Commission. Victoria Romanova, head of Energy Law Department, Kutafin Moscow State Law University. Member of Ministry of Public Council, Ministry of Energy of the Russian Federation. Yevgenia Seremsakov, Head of International Law Department, GSC and Terao. And Georgi Golovanov, Deputy Director of Law Department, Ministry of Energy of the Russian Federation. So, energy resources and energy markets are a priority for all states, irrespective of the locality, be that European Union, Asia or Russia. And irrespective of the fact whether the government produces or the state produces or consumes, or actually depending on the fact whether the government or the state consumes or produces electricity or energy resources, the political priorities and legal framework might differ. And legal principles might differ. And these legal principles are mainly based on the national interest of the state. And this is the uh, main criteria, which uh, which is the cause of uh, misunderstandings between Russia and the European Union and uh, its and some disputes uh, around the third energy package and other legal norms. So harmonization of legislation, it will depend mainly on how various countries and parties to the negotiations are uh, successful in finding common ways of resolving problems of transportation, transit of energy resources, gas, electricity, oil. But it's becoming uh, clear that the search for mutual beneficial solutions serves in the interests of both the consumers, mainly the European Union, and the countries who get natural rent out of selling its energy resources. Uh, in the recent years, the energy dialogue between the European Union and Russia has been halted due to the recent political uh, disturbances, of which we're all aware. But nevertheless, we've been informed that this dialogue, on the basis of European Commission and European Parliaments and Russian Federation, is still ongoing. And it one, uh, once again confirms the necessity to find mutually beneficial solutions and win-win solutions. For example, how the supply of energy resources is going to be supplied and what principles of legal regulation uh, have to be exhorted. 
As we know, every war ends with peace. And everyone will have to agree. Russia, the European Union, and EEU countries. And Russian politicians are uh, outspoken about this. Recently, Mr. Lavrov told about the necessity to continue to cooperate uh, between the European Union and the EEU countries. Uh, the leading politicians of the European Parliament and the West talk about the same. Moreover, the EEU today, because of its geographical features and because of some internal logic that it operates in, uh, it's still a bridge between Europe and Asia. And depending on the fact how parties to the negotiations will behave, it will basically predefine the destiny of EEU, whether, it's, whether it will be a bridge or something else. So keeping this in mind, uh, we, need to m we need to inform you that this discussion is not useless, moreover, it's practical. And today we're going to talk about the main principles of uh, regulations of energy industry in the European Union, in EEU, what potential for closing down this gap and what potential for harmonizing our legislations are there. Is it possible to really harmonize this legislation between Russia and separate countries of the EU, with some countries of EU, with EU in general? Or whether this a new harmonized legislation uh, will marry the global standards and global international uh, law? Um, will it be matching some supranatural organizations? Uh, whether this legislation will cover some other countries not included into those various structures. So that's what we're going to talk about. And I hope that the discussion is going to be very interesting. The logic of this session is as follows. First, we'll give the floor to our European colleagues who will tell us about their experience and the future of this united and single legal framework across the European Union, what experience they had, what future um, has in stock. And that's important for us because we are approaching this. We'll be making a single legislation framework for the, for, uh, for the energy sector in EEU. Then we're going to talk about EEU. We're going to switch over to that and about its future and whether it's possible to really establish a common electricity market in this uh, uh, union. And in the end, we will draw some summaries. Uh, where are we moving? Which road lies ahead? What are we debating? And whether there are any potential opportunities for getting out of this situation? So first, we'll give the floor to Bert Bernd Meiring, a partner from Linklater's LLP, please. The floor is yours. Um, yes, so, sorry for not being able to do this in, in Russian, I should say, first of all. Um, I would like to take the internal perspective with regard to where the EU stands, and I think Nikolai will then talk a little bit more about the interface um, between the EU and the, um, the Russian Union from a trade perspective. So I think looking at the EU and understanding uh, what has happened and what is currently happening in the EU in energy terms um, is interesting for two different reasons for our debate. The first reason is that the EU has a long um, history of trying to create an internal energy market. And this history is not all rosy. There are things that went well. There are things that took much more time than people thought they would. And there are things that simply haven't uh, worked. So I think the first aspect of interest is that, that there are lessons to learn and, and there may be mistakes not to repeat. Um, the, the second uh, aspect is that, of course, understanding the EU, its functioning and its priorities in energy terms is interesting because that's the interface if you want to talk about any 
harmonization or, or interaction later on. So I'm going to briefly talk about uh, where we stand, um, about the Energy Union uh, project, about implementation, um, about competition law enforcement, because that is the tool that the uh, Commission has uh, used a lot uh, to uh, promote its its energy agenda, um, and and I'll finally then uh, turn to an outlook and uh, prospect for market uh, for market integration. The uh, EU is currently facing a dilemma between a, a number of um, policy objectives that are all taken very seriously at EU level, but also with various orders of priority at national level, and that makes it very complicated. Um, we, we're looking at um, sustainability, and in particular environmental sustainability, and there, there is a big debate about things like CO2 uh, and nuclear, with some member states going into very different direction and, and, and that makes a big mess for everybody who is trying to coordinate. Um, finally, uh, secondly, security of supply is a big topic. The EU is of course hugely dependent on imports um, and there has been a debate in particular in recent years about uh, security of supply uh, and, and that has left the technical and reached the, reached the public level uh, now with a couple of countries having faced near blackouts uh, in, the, in the last two years. Uh, in particular with regard to electricity and that, that was very prominently in the press and, and people and electors have been very, uh, very concerned about that. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, there is a huge competitiveness angle to this which pulls the debate yet into a third direction because energy is a very significant cost uh, for much of what is actually produced in Europe and exported out of Europe into other countries. Um, and if you, if you push um, green and secure energy, that comes at a cost and, and that cost might then have knock-on effects uh, on, on other industries. So um, th this is already complicated enough if you had one stakeholder dealing with it. Uh, in the EU, um, we, we have 28 member states um, and European institutions that are trying to coordinate, uh, that, that have um, the monopoly and policy initiatives, but that need to rely very heavily on member states, not only for lawmaking, but also for, for law uh, implementation. Um, so, th there was the uh, third energy packa package, um, wh which we are still implementing, and the, the feeling is that, that things haven't been going so well over the recent years, which fostering an internal en energy market to the point where the Commission has now started to relabel the initiative and is talking about an, an energy union, and I'll come uh, to a couple of um, further details in a minute. Um, of course, the geopolitical debate uh, plays a role and, and has sort of added momentum to a number of things that, that have been going on uh, internally. We, we have a new commission. Uh, since the, the end of last year, and as every new commission, the first couple of months um, uh, it was busy defining its priorities. Uh, today we know that um, energy is one of the priorities um, for the new European Commission, and the issues that have been identified in the, in the debate is, are that markets are still um, too fragmented, that is the big theme. Uh, you can't really talk about one single energy market in Europe today, even though that is where at least the Commission wants to be moving. Um, there is insufficient investment, in particular in cross-border infrastructure, the hardware. I mean, even if you wanted to integrate energy markets in Europe today from the 
political perspective, there is a perception that the hardware in terms of interconnectors is uh, simply not there. The near blackouts have created a lot of uh, awareness about generation issues because, uh, because of liberalization um, and the subsidies to, to green energy. Um, the generation sector in Europe has suffered underinvestment for, for many years and has now reached a point uh, where security uh, of supply is seen to be, uh, to be threatened. Um, and, and, and these are uh, these are the main priorities that the uh, that the that Europe, the European Union, tries to address uh, with uh, the the Energy Union Initiative. So, how does it intend to do that? Uh, the big themes are um, diversification of supply. Um, uh, well, using new sources if you try to reduce old ones, um, but then creating a single energy market. And the basic reasoning behind that is that if you if you have a shortage of supply, um, it, you you and and if you have risks um, with uh, with supply, you need to make sure that grids are open, that markets are open, so that a supply uh, shortage in one place. It can be bridged um, with uh, capacity from elsewhere. Um, and, and that is where market integration comes in. That is where the removing borders to trade with, within the EU in energy comes in. Um, and, and that is also where then topics like unbundling come in. Um, and the idea behind that is to remove some of the, the incentives um, to separate internal markets. Of course, none of this, and that's important to understand, none of this is really new. It's new for energy. But if you look at the history of the European Union, uh, we've seen in the 60s um, big initiatives um, to build an internal market for goods within the EU. And the Commission has been, has, has been using its powers to remove borders. Um, and and, and that, is an, that is an ongoing project in itself that is much further advanced than energy. And the tools that the EU has uh, developed here uh, are tools that it's now uh, trying to sort of experiment with in, uh, in other contexts. So in terms of the timeline, we have a communication on the energy union that's out. Uh, there is a council uh, scheduled in the next month. Um, and there's some there are draft conclusions on that. Um, we, we, we'll see where, where that goes. And still in the second half of um, uh, 2015, the commission wants to come up with uh, legislative proposals and consultations. So, looking at the priorities, I think the one thing that is uncontroversial is the need for investment in generation uh, and also in interconnection infrastructure. Um, pretty much everything else, um, there, there is controversy between the member states and of course things will only move forward if member states uh, agree. And now come to competition law enforcement. I mean, if you talk about energy and legislation, um, the problem, as I said, is member states need to agree. The legislative process in the EU takes significant time. And even once you have legislation in place, typically it needs to be implemented at national level. And the experience with the third energy packets shows that that process in itself is three, four, five years, uh, and even now is not complete. Competition law enforcement is a very different ball game. It's European law enforced by the European Commission. There is no need to legislate. The Commission in itself has the power to enforce competition laws against companies. It doesn't need to ask member states for any approval. 
Um, it is not bound by member state instructions. Uh, it just does what it feels needs to be done um, without uh, all the constraints that are around, um, around uh, legislation. And that's, of course, very tempting for the Commission uh, when you're frustrated and, and you think things are going too slowly. The, uh, some European energies companies have, have learned that the very hard way. I'm talking about companies like E.ON, INI, RWE, which at a time when there were no rules yet on unbundling in Europe, were forced by the European Commission through competition law tools to accept unbundling. Basically, the Commission told them either you unbundle or we, um, we investigate your conduct on the markets and the likely outcome of this will be very high fines. As a result, these companies took, um, took steps towards, uh, towards unbundling. And you see this happening in, in other areas as well. And I think uh, if you look at what's happening today around Gazprom, there is a certain parallelism between these tools uh, and what's happening here. Of course, all that has been heavily criticized. Uh, competition law is not there to replace legislative initiatives, but for the Commission, it has in many areas been a helpful shortcut and it has been able to use powers um, that, that it doesn't have under the energy uh, specific, specific tools. Um, something that the Commission is doing now is uh, looking into capacity mechanism under competition law tools. Again, that is uh, national subsidies to energy generation. Normally, again, you would think that is an area for legislation and harmonization, but because this takes time, because this is controversial, the Commission has now launched a sector investigation under the EU's uh, state aid rules um, in, in order to make progress there. So, so you, see, you, you really see that energy has become a priority not only for, um, uh, from a policy perspective, but also very specifically from a competition law enforcement uh, perspective. So let me uh, briefly talk about the, the Gazprom investigation on the basis of what's out there in the, in the press and, and what, it, what it means uh, from a legal perspective. It, it has three angles. So th there are uh, clauses that limit uh, supplies uh, to the countries uh, into which supply takes place. Uh, th there's some discussion on pricing. And, and finally, there is what we call bundling that is linking energy supply to investments in infrastructure. I think the, from a competition law perspective, there, there is one relatively mainstream allegation that is, um, well, from an EU perspective, that is the first point. It's very clear um, in, under EU law that agreements that aim to separate the EU market into national markets um, well, they restrict competition and they can be scrutinized under competition rules. That is relatively mainstream. More interesting are the other two because these are actually areas where the Commission doesn't have a great track record of enforcing competition laws in other, um, in other areas. Pricing cases are notoriously difficult to bring because you need to show that a price is too high. How do you do that? You need a market price. That's very difficult uh, to, to establish. Um, and bundling is also something companies are typically free to do and it's very, very hard to show that it's abusive. There are precedents, but these are very, very far away from uh, what we see happening in, in energy. Th this case has been dormant for, um, for two years. Not much has happened, uh, but uh, it is on the priority list of the new uh, competition commissioner. So you would expect to see some progress if things go the normal way uh, under the EU timetable within the next year. So, in, in terms of outlook, what can we expect? Uh, the uh, Commission will uh, try to finish what is unfinished, that is really interconnecting 
uh, European energy markets. That is that is the big theme that you have, and uh, and um, all the tools at its um, at its uh, disposition will be will be used for that uh, and one would expect uh, continued use in particular of the competition law tool there as well because it's easier and more flexible um, than legislation. Another thing that there's a lot of talk about is now investment in infrastructure um, uh, projects. Finally, what does it mean for integration with the Eurasian Union? I mean. One thing it seems to me that it means is that the Commission has a, uh, that Europe, the European Union, has a lot on its plate, on its own, just looking at itself. There are so many things that don't work, that are seen not to be there, that are seen uh, as a need to be fixed, and it's almost a paradox that when you see what the what the European Union is focusing on, it is focusing a lot of how energy flows once it is in the EU. And 90% of all these policy initiatives, they are there. What, what happens to the energy that's in the EU once it is there? Now, you would think that uh, for an economic area that relies very heavily on, impo on, on imports, that, that might, might be taking the second step before the first, which is how do we get the energy uh, into the EU and how do we ensure interfaces and rules on trade that make sure that there are attractive uh, conditions for people who, uh, who export energy into the EU. Um, but I think, uh, well, we'll hear about some of these things, but if you look at what Brussels is, has been talking about over the last two or three years, you hear much less about that than about the functioning of the internal market. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Berg. I think we will listen to Nikolai right now. Nikolai Mizulin, a pi partner in Mayor Brown, and then we will ask questions about our European Union. Nikolai, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexander. I apologize. Russia and European Union. At different periods of our history, we were friends and enemies. But what is undoubted is that we have always been partners in the sense that we have been a family of which may be emotional sometimes but we are a family and that's most important where what one party does impacts the other party and that is directly applicable to our relationships in the energy sector where as mr bird just mentioned of uh, the radical reforms of uh, energy which has taken place during the recent years uh, have significantly impacted the energy sector of Russia. In particular, what relates to trade in energy resources between uh, Russia and EU. Um, as by way of introduction, what is the problem? This is a cartoon which shows the point of view of European Union on the relationships between the Russian Federation and Europe in energy supplies. A bear is sitting on the pipeline, which may be shipping gas or oil, but you could actually put that bear on a power line. From the standpoint of EU, they are in a similar position from the standpoint of power. Well, the problem is that this is a very big bear and it, it's sitting on one of the few pipelines leading to the EU, which allows from the EU standpoint the bear to control part of the market and to regulate the pricing in that market. Another key problem is that from the standpoint of the EU, that bear is not very reliable. It's not sitting very well. 
or rather if we touch upon the political issues it sits in a very unpredictable manner so in the long run from the standpoint of safety of delivery safety of supply and uh, that is the reason for a lot of reforms in the European Union that bear must be multiplied or there must be more pipelines more bears and not only from Russia the Russian Federation absolutely does not agree with this approach because naturally we have been considering ourselves a reliable partner for the uh, European countries in the area of energy supply and I'm approaching uh, the essence of my presentation. We do not agree that within the framework of a European energy sector reform, they place uh, barriers to the Russian exports. Uh, let's speak about the legal framework of our regulations. What are the norms that regulate our relationships up to 2009 we could at least speak of the application of the agreement on an energy charter after 2009 uh, this uh, agreement is off the agenda there is an art uh, agreement on partnership and collaboration of 1994 between Russia and the EU that's a good agreement but from the standpoint of lawyers uh, it doesn't provide for a dispute resolution mechanism so it's a futile agreement and you really it's really difficult to use this agreement although you could do uh, that through an application to the European court but what's very important that ever since 2012 uh, Russia has become a member of the WTO just as the EU and although our WTO does not provide for a specific agreements in the area of energy but the framework agreements of WTO are directly applicable to sales of energy resources as well as services in the sphere of energy and I mean of the transportation of oil and gas from the standpoint of specific problems that exist in relationships between Russia and EU, myself and my firm are involved in the process of uh, claims against European uh, laws of in, at WTO, so my position may be subjective, but the our key position is that certainly we are not against Europeans uh, European Union's uh, sovereign right to regulate its own market they can unbundle the transportation separate transportation from generation they may introduce regulations that solve uh, their problems and like Mr. Bird said, uh, this is done for the creation of a single energy market in the U EU. But uh, we are very much against measures that directly touch upon the Russian interests and replace a Russian supplies to the European e energy market. One of the key slogans of the European energy reform was the diversification of supply actually it's really difficult to understand what it really means from the standpoint of uh, laws uh, that were introduced for this diversification one of the measures that we argue against are the different preferences for uh, the energy resources from different countries are uh, through direct subsidies when building pipelines intended to supply gas for instance from from countries that are not members of EU
for instance, from the Persian Gulf or from Northern Africa. We also have uh, a significant disagreement about the third package. We are not against the third package. We are not disbundling. We are not against certification of operators. But there are certain aspects that cause our concern, and that is the additional requirements for certification of suppliers of transportation services in the European market from the standpoint of safety of the supply. This creates an uncertainty for our investment, and it actually, in practice, hinders our service suppliers to work in the transportation uh, service market of uh, the EU. Another problem which is coming to the forefront more and more is the, are the issues of com competition between conventional uh, energy resources exported from Russia with uh, the renewable sources. And I mean the preferences that the EU countries provide to electricity generated either on solar or wind, by solar or wind power. Again, we are not against the renewables to take a certain share of the market, but what we don't like is that uh, the Kaliningrad Oblast cannot export their wind energy to EU not for technological reasons, but because it will not enjoy the preferences that uh, are enjoyed by the EU renewable sources. There were two interesting cases, court cases, when uh, the uh, movement of uh, goods and services was prohibited even for EU generators. And if that even happens uh, with uh, the EU own uh, renewable sources, that certainly creates problems for the Russian renewable sources of energy. There's quite a lot of other problems uh, coming to the forefront related to the fact that the Baltic countries are planning to join the European energy system thus becoming unsynchronized with the Russian and CIS uh, energy system. What will be the consequences and what is the legal component of that? Naturally, the Baltic countries can join and synchronize with whoever they want and move in whatever direction they think fit. But from the standpoint of WTO, this setups a technical barrier in trade, we cannot export because we will not have a technological possibility for that. We would also lose an opportunity of a transit supply to Kaliningrad. In, under WTO regulations, the countries may use technical barriers, but only when they pursue purposes that are different from protectionism and that do not infringe on the interests of third parties. Uh, Baltic countries are openly speaking that their issue of leaving uh, the Russian energy system, which embraces Russia and CIS, is the diversification of supply and direct refusal from Russian energy. The Baltic countries have also introduced a number of measures uh, which are at discord with even European rules, anti-monopoly rules, and which infringe upon the capability of uh, Russian exporters to be present in the Baltic market. The isolation of Kaliningrad will be a separate issue, but let's see what decisions will be made concerning the Baltic NPP. Coming back to WTO and summarizing the essence 
of our claims again, not to the reform, not to the laws as such, but to the aspects that discriminate against Russian gas and Russian suppliers of power. The certification of systems operations and adding of the additional criteria is a violation of the national regime. Subsidizing is linked to the national production, which uh, is in contradiction with uh, WTO uh, provisions on subsidies. And also, a significant claim on our part is the long-term strategy, which is not recognized by uh, EU, but which ensues, in fact, from a number of measures already taken, and that is the strategy intended to reduce Russian import. When the third energy package uh, was uh, accepted, uh, Russia was not a member of WTO, so this uh, international agreement was not applicable to our relationships. Now it is applicable, and uh, forgetting our policy, we can discuss uh, all those problems completely on a legal basis. And to end, I would like to touch upon another social issue, and coming back to our claim our claim, uh, and that is, who are we judging? You know that uh, EU have been integrating for over 50 years, and from the standpoint of international law in the sphere of energy, the competence is joined between uh, between the EU and the member countries of EU. And actually, uh, we uh, have claims against 29 entities, that's the European Union and 28 of its member countries. Uh, a few years ago, the European Commission achieved uh, the result when the competence was the European Commission right now, uh, with exclusion of certain aspects, has the full competency in uh, these aspects and is actually uh, the one common defendant. But from the standpoint of international law, uh, the after the uh, foundation of the Eurasian Economic Union, the question will be who will be the plaintiff, uh, and this problem will have to be resolved. And I will pass the floor to Victor now. Thank you, Nikolai. I recalled that about six years ago, we went to Fingrid in Finland, then to Brussels, and we discussed the issues of why the Finnish regulator uh, taxes uh, the energy imported from Russia and applies much higher tariffs than for the energy that was supplied from other post-Soviet countries. And uh, the European Commission, the Department of Energy, responded, guys, but your energy is cheap. Your costs are very low. And probably this is one of the logics that is applied to our supplies. I have a question to Mr. Bird. How much do European countries, which are member countries of EU, are satisfied with uh, this uh, new regulation? And what is the relationship uh, between the supranational and national interests of um, European countries. Are there any contradictions uh, between the common European uh, laws and uh, the laws of separate countries? And speaking about the uh, antitrust regulation, this is uh, the 
field of uh, law that actually impacts very much the investment process in energy. Uh, what is the uh, situation uh, between the national anti-monopoly agencies and the European anti-monopoly agency? Thank you. I'll, I'll resist the temptation to take the second one first, which is a bit easier than the first one, and I'll start with your, with your first question, which is actually very complex. Are member states um, aligned with, uh, with what the EU institutions are doing? Um, th there is a very complex pattern here, and uh, national interests are not aligned as such because one of the principles that we still have in the EU is that each member state um, has sovereignty and is, is, is master of its own energy mix. So there is no European um, prerogative to determine the energy mix that is used in the EU. And actually on this very topic different um, countries in Europe go very different ways. So you've, you've Germany uh, and Austria and a couple of others uh, who've moved out of nuclear. Um, you have countries like uh, France in particular, which is investing in nuclear because it's, it solves uh, the, the, or they seem to be a part of the solution to the CO2 issues. You've then um, large economies, uh, again like Germany, which um, for whom it's easier to get good access terms for for gas because they are large markets and they 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 can they, they can with a lot of demand uh, and they can negotiate better you have smaller markets uh, with completely different constraints um, you have uh, economies that are really investing into into green energy quite a lot and then face issues of uh, of security of supply that they need to solve one way or another or another so we we do not have a a, a common policy objective between member states and the eu's energy policy is much more uh, driven by the lowest common denominator on a uh, while there are a couple of things that need to happen uh, rather than by a full alignment of member states i think the only point with which everybody seems to agree and seems to be happy is that there has been underinvestment in infrastructure and that is both transportation infrastructure and generation infrastructure and that that is something that needs to change urgently i think that that is that there is broad consensus around that i think all of the other topics as very often in european legislation they are compromises between different positions and there are lots of uh, trades like well i know you want this, I don't want it, but I, I, I will agree to it if you agree to wha what I want on another topic. So th there is no good alignment. So antitrust, what, what, are, the, um, uh, what are the rules that, that apply there? Uh, and how does it work between the Commission and national antitrust regulators? That, that is um, much less messy because um, antitrust in Europe is an exclusive EU competence. Uh, the EU sets most of the laws for the entire territory of the European Union and the Commission enforces the laws. There is no need for national anti-monopoly uh, regulators uh, for the Commission and the Commission is not bound by, by what these agencies say. Um, and, and it is actually, in practice, uh, not listening a great deal to, to what they say. Now, there is uh, national anti-monopoly uh, enforcement as well, but that is today limited to a, a relatively small number of areas in which you have national specificities, and the rule there is that national agencies can act as long as what they do does not contradict commission enforcement actions. So, so the commission is very clearly running the show in, in terms of antitrust enforcement and there is little uh, national uh, authorities can do if they don't like what they see. Спасибо. 
Thank you very much. So it, it seems that they need to agree about the basic principle of building common grounds and common space. And probably that's what we're going to have in the future. So first we're going to agree and then uh, we'll start building the common legal principles and the common legal framework. So Igor now will tell us about what's happening with the EU here. And he will tell us about the common and single electrical energy market in EEU. Because as far as we remember, and as far as you probably remember, three new international agreements will be signed that will lead us to this common single energy market. I think the first one is up to 2018, if I'm not mistaken, yes. Uh, then the gas market and then the oil market. I think oil market will appear in 2022-2024 or something. Am I mistaken? Okay, yes, let's do this. Do you want a question? Okay. I have a question. When uh, Dmitry Medvedev was Russian president, he announced a new conceptual approach uh, to the legal framework that regulates energy relations and it was published back in April and when he made a speech about it he said that Russia will prepare a document, will draft a document and this document saw light, it's a draft convention on international energy security. This document was presented by the Russian side to the European Economic Commission in the EU and as of now the fate of this document is still unclear. So what I would like to get to know, it's clear that we've uh, uh, went out of this um, committee, so w w w Europe will not go away from DEC, uh, so whether there will be DEC 2 or something else, we still need to agree. Uh, if you have any information about this, can we please hear on it? Briefly answering? The initiative of Dmitry Anatolievich back then was about the fact that the well, the negotiations were blocked. They were they were halted by the European side uh, because they made an attempt of uh, removing all the energy issues to a separate energy agreement and. Uh, to sum up the position of the European Union, um, this this format is not interesting for them, and it remains uninteresting for them. As for the uh, body of the agreement and the, the framework of agreement, is interesting for the European Commission, but they only want to ensure rights of producing in the Russian market, they want the rights that will allow them to protect their investments and this particular area does not cause a lot of interest back in Russia and at least the interest is much lower. So the situation is the same and it remains the same, the negotiations have been halted and there is no movement. Thank you. Unfortunately. Okay, Victor, then probably the floor goes to you. Since there's no movement towards the west, let's talk about the east. Thank you. Allow me to welcome all the participants of the round table. Uh, this year, world energy lives in a new stage of its development, which is characterized by an increased competition for accessing the markets and uh, oil and gas reserves. That's why this situation leads us to ensure competition, better competition of our oil and energy businesses and ensuring energy security in the country. A strategic decision was to sign a, uh, an agreement on uh, Eurasian Economic Union between Russia, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Armenia and it led these countries to reach a new level of economic integration ensuring free movement of goods, labor and services. It was signed in May 2013. The agreement 
particularly stipulates for the objectives and tasks of the cooperation of the member countries in the energy sector. And in particular, the development of long-term mutually beneficial cooperation, conducting uh, an agreed energy policy, a stage-by-stage -stage establishment of common energy markets. And in order to carry out the last task of the agreement, the Union plans for creating a single legal framework for each particular resource, energy, oil, gas, and electricity. And it has to be built in accordance with a single algorithm. First, the concept has to be prepared, and then a sub-program will be drafted. And after the sub-program is drafted, an international agreement will be signed about the common energy market. And this agreement will also have to include common rules of getting access to services, that will allow this market to operate efficiently. The nearest task is to formulate the common electrical energy market. Let me talk about the prerequisites and the problems of establishing a common electrical energy market. First, uh, we have reserves of generating and transiting capacities. The infrastructure is being developed. Some of the energy systems are working in parallel. There are different prices of the electrical energy, and the agreement itself is one of the prerequisites. The problem, the problems, uh, different structures of energy markets in the countries, differences in legislations betwe between the countries that regulate electrical energy, various barriers and limitations of uh, in, in mutual trade of energy and capacities. 8th of May 2015, quite recently, the Supreme Eurasian Economic Council has adopted the concept of the common electrical energy market of the EEU. I'm uh, stressing that it's uh, a common, not a single market. Uh, the main principle of the common electrical energy market is that we need to cooperate based on equality, mutual benefit, and uh, no damage. Uh, the balance of interest uh, of consumers and generating companies. A stage-by-stage -stage harmonization of the legislation. The usage of mechanisms built on market mechanisms and fair competition, giving um, access to um, the grid of various companies. And stage-by-stage -stage transformation of vertically integrated companies uh, selecting competition and c monopoly businesses. And we need to establish the market taking into consideration the specificities of the particular member states' markets. We need to use technical and economic benefits of the parallel activities. We need to provide access uh, to producers and consumers of the energy at member states, considering the interests of national economies. Uh, trading of electrical energy uh, has to be done uh, taking into account the issue of energy security. So the conceptual platforms and the conceptual approaches to common energy market. First, a common uh, policy has to be elaborated, uh, some, nor some laws have to be uh, prepared, and a particular management structure or governance structure. The acts or the documents that regulate the common energy market. First is the international agreement on the common energy market, particular acts of various uh, EEU bodies about the subjects of the market and uh, ways of accessing the trade. Two bilateral, two-way or bilateral agreements, um, agreements uh, on a day-after basis, and so on. Uh, the step-by-step -step process of uh, legal uh, framework establishment. I said to you that the concept has already been adopted on the 8th of uh, May. Next year we'll be developing the program and the roadmap for the common energy markets. And before the 1st of July 2018, an international agreement has to be signed on establishing a common energy market. As I said before, the agreement on Eurasian Economic Union also provides for uh, this international treaty to be signed about the common 
energy market. And this treaty or this agreement has to include common rules of getting access uh, of natural monopolies in electrical energy to the common market. Moreover, what else is needed to be adopted and developed? The rules and guidelines on interaction between various subjects and regulators in the markets. The ways of um, trading electrical energy in the market. For a success of this electrical energy, common electrical energy market, a uh, huge job is required in introducing changes and harmonizing national legislations in the sphere of energy. And considering the fact that we're soon to launch into a very extensive legislative work, I'd like to stress out that this event where various experts, international experts, uh, participate is a timely one. And since we're a new body and we're a new structure, we need to take all the mistakes and learn from them, take positive lessons uh, from the European Union and any other institutions like this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victor. I know for sure that there are people in here who are really experts in electrical energy and uh, uh, considering what Mr. Burns said, that three to five years sometimes is required to develop and implement a, legislature, a legislation that would regulate common principles and approaches uh, to the overall legal framework is needed. Well, let me remind you how the Common Customs Union was established five or six years ago. Frankly speaking, well, I believe it's uh, very unlikely. And again, considering the fact that the legislations of countries like Russia, Belarus and Kazakhstan are considerably different uh, when it comes to electrical energy, well, I don't believe that it is possible to make a common electrical energy market until 2018. You yourself, how do you really see the possibilities of carrying out this plan? Do you think it's just going to be a declarative document or uh, something real? Can I ask your point of view? Thank you very much. Well, first, it's not a single but a common energy market, as we've told you. Because, well, and that's, what's the main difference? Because uh, it will mainly be a coordinated market of electrical energy. It means that every member state will preserve its own market. That's first condition. Second condition, the agreement uh, stipulates for the time frame quite rigidly, Article number 104, and it's already been approved and adopted by the Supreme Council. And there are no doubts uh, that it will be a success because we bear a lot of responsibilities for that we have a man our main body is the executive authority or the executive body of the union it's uh, represented by a collegia a group of experts that uh, oversee these tasks and I'm pretty sure that by the time specified in the document we'll be able to deliver all the necessary legal frameworks the only question is this it's easy to develop something, but it's hard to agree on something. And uh, some of our experience showed that all the clauses of the agreements, all the articles of the agreements were agreed between the various participants or various member states of the Union in one year. One year it took. And that's one aspect and one difficulty that we see uh, will uh, uh, hold the work uh, for this reason, uh, we've agreed on the regulations, uh, we've uh, developed various committees, interdisciplinary committees, who have different authorities and different powers. So, probably, probably judging by the speed we're moving right now, judging by the milestones we've already achieved uh, in getting all the necessary consensus, and it's a very difficult process, let me tell you. In order to you know, approve something, in order to agree something between the parties, as I've told you, it might take up to one year. But we've already have some experience. We have some experience. And today, various bodies and ministries of our member states 
are moving in a good speed and I think uh, we will be able to get there on time. Thank you very much. Hopefully that by 2018 we'll sign something. The other question is uh, who needs us most and who will get the best the, 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 the benefit from it because I recall the talks we had five years ago. We want the interests of energy companies to be considered, in particular in the Russian Federation. Because when this uh, type of agreements are signed, and I remember we were uh, a participant party in some of the negotiations uh, about the customs union, so we want this document to be fully accountable of the interests of all the parties. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question to Victor here. My question is, the members of EEU are on a different level of their market organization. In Kazakhstan and Russia, they have wholesale market, and in Belarus, there's no wholesale market. They have vertically integrated companies. One company, Bel Energa, which owns and operates in the market. So, Belarus, does it plan to reform its system? And will they be able to succeed until 2018? And do they really need to reform the system in order to be a part of the common energy market? Well, our concept, and I told you about this, uh, clearly describes what should be done, that vertical integrated companies had to be uh, unbundled. And Belarus signed under this document, and they signed under the concept uh, on the 8th of May. In Belarus, uh, they have some particular decrees and some particular orders of the government uh, paving the way towards this uh, achievement. Whether they need it or not, it's another question, because Belenerga has a big infrastructure and they have their own pricing conditions. And if the market is open, I think if Belarus receives energy from Kazakhstan and from Russia at a different price point, I believe that It will lead to damping. And in accordance with the law, Belarus will have to admit Russians and Kazakhs to their market. But then we will be able to resolve this question in a technical way. We'll be trying to use more transparent mechanisms of pricing. So Belarus agreed and they signed under the agreement. Of course, it was one of their proposals. Uh, they want uh, this unbundling to be included in the concept. Right now I don't have any doubts that it will be done. Okay, let me ask you one more question there. Uh, a more practical question. Uh, production of electricity in three countries, Russia, Belarus and Kazakhstan, and generation of electricity in these three countries. We know that uh, in time, electricity may cost more, may cost less, depending on various factors. In Kazakhstan, for example, the electricity is cheaper. I mean, uh, the cost of producing electricity is cheaper than in Russia. This concept provides for a common market and that um, generating companies of Kazakhstan can get access to the Russian market. Well, in this case, I will have to close down some of my generation capacities. I will have to stop down the electrical plants. I have to fire people. I will not be paying taxes to the budget of the Russian Federation if it comes to, uh, to this. So, and this question is not only to Viktor, actually. I'm, I'm just throwing it out for discussion. So what barriers can there be? What limiters can there be? And do you, you and do you really foresee them in this document and limiting third parties' access to our energy markets? And my question also goes to our European colleagues. If you have similar experiences, please share some of the views with us. You want me to answer first? Okay. Well, in my opinion, uh, there is a problem like that, but uh, conceptual idea of the common market is the energy safety which orients all the state authorities and agencies to implement this principle so in the program that we started developing and i hope that the supreme council will sign our initiative uh, next year uh, the uh, parties will accept the algorithm 
of uh, participating in their own market, taking in the common interest into account. Uh, right now, uh, we generate 1.2 trillion kilowatt hours annually, but uh, we only trade 6 billion kilowatt hours with the European Union, and that is the main condition for the integration process. This is a kind of uh, a grounds from which we could move uh, to develop uh, the conditions. So the energy safety and security is above all about the freedom of movement of goods and uh, services and labor is mandatory. So we need to find uh, a golden mean, a golden uh, balance between that. I think from a, from a European perspective on, on this, if you, if you take other examples than, than energy, which, which may be seen as less sensitive, but when, when the common market was, was established on, on, on goods and services, um, you had a lot of this happening, and, and financial markets are a good example where today really Euro the European main financial center is, is in London. Uh, the fact that there is an internal market has facilitated that and had le has led to closing down uh, capabilities um, in, in the capital. Now, now, money needs less of an infrastructure to move than, than energy, and, and the same applies to goods, where we have seen economies moving out of certain areas because other member states were more efficient and cheaper with production. In energy, this hasn't happened yet, and it's, it's unlikely to happen anytime soon, because you can introduce all legislation um, that you want, as long as you don't have the interconnection hardware between different energy markets, uh, not a lot is going to happen. You're mainly talking about importing energy from one or the other country. If you really want to move to a single market, energy needs to flow freely within that market. And that does not only require legislation, it also requires hardware. And in, in Europe, I think, well, le legislation is, is, is moving there. It is certainly far from being there. But hardware is probably even further, further behind. And that's why we haven't seen these things. But as soon as, I mean, if all these investment projects succeed, and the, the EU's objective is to come to a situation where um, in each member state, there is the hardware to export at least 10% of the electricity that is domestically produced. We, we are far from being there. And, and you see, even 10% is 90% will have to be consumed domestically if you can only export 10%. And even there, we are not. But, but if this succeeds and if this goes up, you will see some of, some of these effects. There, there is no doubt about it. Um, but as you see this, uh, Europe takes these things very, very gradually and even moving to 10% uh, to inter, um, interconnection for electricity is already a big political topic. It takes a lot of time. Thank you. Yes, Nikolai? Just a couple of words. First, in principle, the idea of integration is to uh, actually for the less efficient uh, industries, less efficient production to disappear and the, that the investments go to more successful companies. Uh, but ans answering the legal issue, or the legal question in EU, there is a possibility uh, to refer to an exclusion because of the security issues. You can guarantee a certain amount of sales to a um, uh, power plant, 
but for that per uh, for, for that uh, you have to uh, get, uh, you have to prove uh, that uh, this uh, power plant is necessary for the security of the country victoria romanova head of the department of energy law at moscow university you're welcome victoria Good afternoon. First and foremost, I would like to thank you for an opportunity to participate in this very interesting discussion, which focuses on a very important issue. And I would like somehow the technology failed us the clicker doesn't work but I will try to lay it out R being remindful of those technical problems I would like to speak about the issues that I would like to discuss here today a lot has been said about the problems uh, and first and foremost legal problems in the formation of international energy markets about of different markets the european market the energy market of the eurasian economic union the common market of oil and gas and petroleum products and a lot of uh, legal issues have already been raised the legal issues uh, faced by uh, the energy companies in the process of uh, their activities in certain energy markets and what's very important, uh, issues were raised that arise at the stage of uh, developing conceptual documents and international treaties that provide for a mutually beneficial collaboration when forming common energy markets. When preparing for this presentation, I borrowed examples from a Europe Eurasian energy integration, the issues of harmonization of and unification of law, which is necessary for certain reasons. One should note that the range of relationships that arise uh, when forming common uh, markets of uh, energy resources within the Eurasian Economic Union, those are the relationships between the member states of that union, it is the relations between Eurasian Union and third parties, third countries, it's the relationship between member states of the Eurasian countries, Eurasian Union countries and other countries, and uh, the relationships between their energy companies, including the natural monopolies and uh, the buyers of goods and services. Correspondingly, the issues of international legal unification and harmonization of law when forming such common energy markets, those issues are of great importance. And by way of example, you could take provisions of the agreement on European uh, Eurasian uh, 
common market uh, that touch upon uh, the market of oil and petroleum products. And I would like to attract your attention to uh, the legal issues which will be faced by the developers of subsequent doc documents, the concepts and the international agreements, and certainly will be faced by lawyers from energy companies, consulting firms, and state authorities and international organizations. Those issues relate first and foremost to the limits set in the Eurasian Union Agreement on Unification, the harmonization, limits of harmonization of law and a possibility when developing a conceptual document and when developing uh, uh, agreements in the market uh, and possibility of uh, going beyond the limits that have been set by the agreement on the Eurasian Economic Union. These issues ensue from the circumstance that the agreement on the Eurasian Economic Union already provides a definition for unification, a definition of harmonization of law, and the sections of the agreement that touch upon the formation of a, a market for oil and oil products already have a significant uh, commonality of perception of uh, the common market of oil and oil products. For the purpose of regulating relationships in the market of oil and oil products, such notions have been introduced as oil and oil products, a common market for them, the transportation of oil, access to uh, the services of natural monopolies in the sphere of transportation of oil and petroleum products. And these definitions especially the definition of oil and petroleum products, were probably introduced because of the agreement on the Europe Eurasian Economic Union provides for unification of standards and regulations pertaining to oil and oil products among the member states. The unification is to mean identical of defi identical definitions. The, if you look at harmonization of law, that is different because we are not talking here about identity. We are talking about comparable or similar law. At the same time, the developers and the practitioners will have to be guided by the criterion of compa uh, comparability and or similarity of law. And probably this criteria, criteria will be difficult to define for different reasons. First and foremost, that relates to the natural monopolies and their activities, because if we look at the energy sector, it is typical for the members or players in the market of Eurasian Union that uh, activities within uh, the energy sector are mostly activities by natural monopolies. And if we look at the tables which compare the laws of the member states in the Eurasian Union, their laws on oil and oil uh, products 
and their laws on natural monopolies are very similar. However, the situation is absolutely different for gas. And if we look at Appendix 2 to the protocol on the single principles of regulating uh, natural monopolies, According to the Russian law, the natural monopolies include pipelines, gas pipelines. In Belarus, it is uh, the uh, transportation of gas in major and distribution networks. In Kazakhstan, it is, uh, includes also the tanks and transportation of gas. Uh, in Armenia, it is transportation of natural gas and services in distribution of natural gas and of the uh, services by the operator of the gas distribution system. Naturally, that under this situation, legal issues of uh, the implementation of uh, those uh, 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 provisions will be very serious will need a very serious work so that we could achieve a comparability uh, and similarity in that language if we look at a possibility of going beyond uh, the provisions on unification embodied in the Eurasian Union Agreement, you should pay attention to the fact that uh, this agreement makes uh, a caveat that the sphere of unification pertain to the member states of the Eurasian uh, Economic Union and also pertain strictly to the spheres described in the agreement. There's every reason to make a conclusion that when developing conceptual provisions and international agreements on oil and oil products and also and provisions on uh, the common energy market are formulated in a broader fashion. The limitations embodied in this um, agreement will touch upon the unification of uh, norms and regulations uh, applied to oil and oil products. As for the gas market, there are also some regulations that touch upon the infrastructure. Within the domain of harmonization, the situation is different. There is not no limitation concerning uh, harmonization of only the spheres embodied in the agreement. So when developing conceptual documents and when developing um, international agreements are concerning oil, oil products and the gas market, there is a possibility to develop provisions that are indicated in the appropriate provisions of this law, of this agreement, and so uh, this work may encompass a very wide uh, range of relationships that arise when a new market is formed. Another aspect that the developers and the practitioners will have to face. That is the development of provision, provisions taking account of the fact that uh, the agreement also stipulates a possibility of uh, agreements between the member states and third parties states. And so, because in this case, uh, it will not only the member states, but other parties will be involved in the agreements. And one should bear in mind that the member states shall be abide by uh, the 
requirements already embodied in the agreement on the Europe Eurasian Economic Union saying that all the documents that are part of uh, the Union law must not contradict the agreement on the Europe Eurasian uh, Economic Union, and uh, this agreement takes priority. So the lawyers are in for a huge amount of work, and they will have to provide uh, the legal analysis of national legislations, and they will have to work hard on especially international agreements, provisions. However, this all is possible because the provisions of the agreement on the Eurasian Economic Unions are, as Vladimir Putin correctly said, they set the main principles of economic collaboration such as mutual respect, pragmatism, and mutually beneficial co collaboration. So hope we hope that the subsequent work will also be successful. Thank you very much. What I'd like to add is that today um, there's a big debate about whether such discipline as energy law really exists. And uh, Many say that there's no such thing, and it is governed by mainly civil codes, corporate laws, or whatever, anti-monopoly laws. Uh, and they, and uh, energy is regulated by many other sectors and industries. But to my mind, I think we can already start talking about this, because energy uh, energy resources are basically the main stumbling point and stumbling block uh, for many uh, states relations for many uh, relations between uh, different supranatural bodies so we need to talk about the energy law already now as something regulating uh, various points of this matter. We know that uh, the Moscow State University, the institute of, uh, named after Kutafin, are very serious about this discipline and they pay a lot of attention to it and it continues to develop. Uh, Victoria here is in charge of one of the departments uh, in, in a Moscow University. Why I'm talking about this? Because we really want to bring this to the, we really want to bring the attention of uh, um, we really want to, to, to bring to everyone's attention the necessity to train um, people and we really want to see not technical regulations but really a law because when basic principles take just two lines and then 86 pages are spent on uh, writing technical formulas uh, and then uh, law enforcers have to really bump their head on this wall because they don't know how to use this document 86 pages long which is useless in terms of juris in terms of uh, legal power and in terms of uh, judicial power and sorry for being that harsh but it's uh, noted by everyone even by the uh, judges of the Supreme Court of Russian Federation that's why we want uh, this relations to exist and to multiply Victor it's actually a request to you it's a direct request to you of attracting experts and people and now I suggest we give the floor to Yevgeny Saimsakov, who is the head of international, uh, uh, the deputy director, uh, sorry, who is the head of international law department GSC in Terao. Yevgeny, can you please tell us uh, how are we moving uh, in the lines of energy cooperation with the EU? Is there a problem or is there a solution? Thank you very much, Alexander. Let me talk about. 
the energy cooperation between our two integrational structures, and this topic has already been raised by a couple of speakers in the beginning. Let me touch upon uh, briefly such a thing as the EU-Russia energy dialogue. Let me first start from the definition of the energy strategy, which was approved by the order of the government of the Russian Federation. And uh, you can find there in this energy strategy some of the goals that we have uh, uh, in terms of cooperation with the EU. And I give a reference to the energy strategy here. And it says that we need to contribute to developing um, uh, common European, Russian, Asian energy area. And let me remind you that this decree dates back to 2009, the strategy in particular. And uh, its uh, validity period is up to 2030. Uh, so uh, th th this idea was already um, conceived in the past and now it continues to be one of the priorities so although there are some problems we continue we want to continue the dialogue between the European Union and the new structure which was established just in the beginning of this year the Eurasian Union if we just briefly scratch the surface of this energy dialogue tool what is this tool about it, it exists since 2001 and it consists of several thematic groups and a council, an advisory council on gas. All in all, there are four groups, as it is said on the website. All those groups deal with different topics and different uh, sectors. And the work we did, the Ministry of Energy did, and some of the corresponding structures uh, from the EU was um, mainly to adopt a roadmap. Uh, for the Russia-EU energy cooperation uh, until 2050. The main objective of this roadmap is designed to determine ways and stages, mechanisms and guidelines for formation of the common energy area. Basically, the things that the EU and EEU are trying to achieve on, uh, on their own. What I would like to emphasize here is that we use similar principles like in the European Union. So I see there is an opportunity for uh, cooperation. And these opportunities were implemented as basic principles and approaches of our roadmap. Let me just briefly touch upon the risk factors that um, uh, that we have uh, in our dialogue, and that's actually what uh, Nikolai and Mr. Bernd uh, talked about. Well, first, what I would like to note here is there is some legal barriers, the third energy package and their limits, the discrepancy between the EU import standards and the WTO rules. Nikolai was very specific about it. One of the major problems, again, uh, outlined in the very beginning of the conference, is that the currently the Russia-EU energy dialogue is virtually terminated. And it's a pity because it's a very good venue. And today this venue needs some resetting. Some very serious resetting. And it became, and it fell victim to political um, problems. And uh, the position of the Russian uh, of, of the Russian Federation and the European Commission can be seen from this slide. For example, Mr. Novak, who is the Minister of Energy of the Russian Federation, supports the renewal of Russia-EU energy dialogues. So we stand on uh, on the position of openness. But the European Commission, unfortunately, uh, dissipates no official renewal. However, we are very optimistic. And we are sure that in some way and in some form this cooperation will uh, be resurrected, um, will spring back to action. Because even in May we did some additional steps uh, towards this cooperation under the EEU um, framework. And I think the European Union needs to mo be more proactive in cooperating with the Eurasian Union and EEU and with its executive bodies and hopefully this conference will give an impetus and a push towards this uh, 
uh, situation. So what is contained in the roadmap? Uh, the roadmap is divided into three stages. Uh, some of the things have to be completed up to 2020, others up to 2030, and the remaining ones to 2050. Actually, it's very similar to the concept that's adopted by the EEU, uh, just the dates are a little bit different, uh, they're a little bit more uh, far-fetched. As for unification of our approaches, well, first we provide the necessary means. We need to do an analysis and we need to study uh, this uh, scenario and the need for further development. And we really want this work to continue irrespective of the changes, uh, of the challenges, because when first our common electrical energy market is there and is in place, it will be, to my mind, much harder to build new approaches. Because uh, when we have our own integration um, movements and uh, the European Union uh, is um, interacting with us quite uh, um, slowly, and that can uh, impose additional difficulties over uh, this initiative. So one of the measures and one of the objectives up to 2020 was to establish better uh, interrelations and uh, uh, interaction uh, between various regulators. Uh, we wanted our federal tariff service and various EU regulators to cooperate, including some super national regulators, international regulators. Uh, as for the way we can really make our legislations close and how to really develop them and how to make them beneficial for investments and uh, uh, additional development that's actually prescribed as well in the strategy until 2020 and by 2050 we planned and we were hoping for creating not the common but probably the single electric power area that would integrate all the energy systems and markets in one and today it's still an open question because there is a lack of interaction today and probably today this particular objective will take a little bit more time. So I tried to try to systemize some of the legal barriers that we still have uh, between EU, Russia and EEU. So what are the bottlenecks and uh, where are the opportunities of bringing them closer to each other? Now, let me tell you that in the EU there's a principle of unbundling that uh, it's that exists in the third energy package and it mig migrated in some changed form and way to our legislation. However, the legislation of several EEU members such as Belarus still require additional efforts to be put in to um, liberate the markets. As Victor has said, there will be no problem with the Belarus. And it has to be done to reform the existing vertical integrated companies so that all legislations are single in uh, this topic. Uh, let me also note a very special uh, ro attitude of the European Union towards the access of third parties to markets and there's the third country clause or the Casprom clause and this clause significantly makes our lives uh, difficult it's it's making the process of integration more difficult and it will continue to do so until all the legal issues including pricing are decided on now as regards the EU analysis, what I need to say in this regard is that uh, in all our markets, in our gas market, in our electricity market, in our oil market, um, we see a very good development in Russia and Kazakhstan in particular. And what's needed is basically unify our legislations with the legislation of Belarus. Nikolai 
already told us about the discrepancy between the EU standards and international agreements, for example, the WTO rules, the derogations in relation to contracts such as take or pay, right? It's Article 48 of the Third Gas Directive and derogations in relation to new and isolated markets. Uh, that's what we're trying to work on quite hard today. But at the same time, in Russia and in EU, just gas transportation activity or business is a monopoly, a natural monopoly. In all other spheres, we've streamlined our legislation and we've balanced it off with the European one. We've allowed third parties to get access to those markets and uh, I think Belarus now has to do a breakthrough uh, and really try to streamline their legislation so that this overall concept of the open market works uh, at its full capacity. Uh, what I would like to mention is the legislation of our three countries doesn't contain any particular acts or sub-laws on direct foreign investments into these areas of the economy. There are some clauses, but they're not enough. So even today with the EU, we face a situation when an investor of one state has to defend his rights and his interests using uh, court, basically, international courts, and because there is no um, competitive EEU courts available yet that would deal with these claims. That's why we believe that it's going to be a very good step and it will be a very good step to continue to integrate our states together. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And I have exhausted my time limit. Yes, truly, we did have a case, a situation when we couldn't get uh, good legal protection in Kazakhstan from a Kazakh regulator and the only competitive uh, the only court that had competence that had knowledge and had experience where uh, the interests of our daughter company could be argued and protected was London the international London the international court in London so it means and it calls for a new system of uh, judicial protection of investors here in the territory of the EEU so that investments to Kazakhstan, Belarus, and let's be frank, the investment regime in this country is, is not the most beneficial one. Unfortunately, the government and the regulators uh, can impose certain actions on investors. So we want the legal system, the judicial system of the EU, the court system of the EU to be stable, solid, uh, to, to be based on good principles. And after listening to the representative of the Ministry of Energy, I think uh, would now will now do a short summary. Each of us will say just for a couple of for a couple of minutes some final thoughts. And now I would like to give the floor to Georgi. Uh, please just tell us about the main trends. Where are we moving to, dear colleagues? It's a pleasure to speak at this very representative venue and at this very representative session. I'd like to thank the, op the, the moderators of the forum, the organizers of the forum. Thank you very much. The main objective of uh, regulating energy complex of Russia is to maximize the use of energy potential of Russia, uh, its maximum integration into the global market, getting stable position in this market and realizing the priorities of Russia considering the interests of our partners of the Eurasian Union. So these objectives, they define the overall trend which our national regulation follows. 
and uh, which the EEU legal framework follows. And this is the way that the international um, well, legislation in relation to international relations also follow. So such areas as uh, developing offshore exploration and uh, Caspian Sea development are the key ones on our agenda. And the Ministry of Energy is trying to be very active pursuing those lines. For example, there is a law now being currently approved about introducing amendments to a number of uh, legislative acts, such as uh, the law on the uh, Russian sector of the Caspian Sea, the law on the rights for artificial islands and any other uh, hydrotechnical structures uh, offshore. So these are the ideas that the business is trying to promote and the government is trying to listen to the business. So another important area is um, produce production of liquefied natural gas, it's transportation. So we're trying to actively liberalize uh, exports of LNG. Well, considering the sanctions regime against Russian exporters, one of the major, one of the main areas uh, is uh, moving towards the east and pivoting towards the east and tapping the Asian mar uh, markets. So today a couple of uh, uh, norms and regulations were adopted um, with the help of the Minister of Energy, for example, 9th of August 2014, there's a decree of the government. And this decree is about the way the information has to be presented to the ministry by the exporters on the um, exporting of liquefied natural gas. There is also an order and a regulation about the way that the government will give licenses for LNG export. And also on the 14th of July 2014, the government has extended the list of companies who are who have the right to export LNG. At the next level, in regulating uh, the fuel and energy industry, is the Eurasian Economic Union, as I said. It seems that the advantage of this union for regulating the fuel and energy sector is quite obvious. Such advantages uh, constitute the removal of barriers in resource training, in technologies, and in services related thereto. Another important set of objectives to be implemented in the Eurasian Economic Union is the provision of security of energy supply by harmonization of uh, norm standards rules and instructions for uh, the infrastructure operation in the territory of uh, Eurasian Economic Union. As a result, there is another advantage and that is uh, a favorable investment climate that would be interesting for investors and would attract investors in such uh, capital consuming uh, area as uh, fuel and energy industry. The agreement on Eurasian Economic Union contains a number of sections and appendices which regulate directly uh, this uh, area, that is Appendix 22-23-23 to the agreement, as well as Section 20 of the agreement itself, which are intended to provide access uh, to the services of natural monopolies in the area of electric energy, uh, transportation of natural gas, and also regulating uh, the development of a common market of oil and oil products. There's also a number of regulations which 
will be necessary to pass in the nearest future. The drafts for those regulations have already been developed. Those is of the methodology for the development of indicative balances of oil and oil procedures. Uh, right now it's pending national approvals. Uh, this is a very important document intended to find uh, the volumes of those resources necessary for each of the member states. Another plan intended to implement the agreement on Eurasian Economic Union will be the International Agreement on Unification of Prices on Oil and Oil Products, but there is uh, an opinion that we should cancel developing this document, or we should regulate that at the level of technical specifications and a list of standards which will be adopted each in its own area. <clears throat> Speaking of the technical specifications, whose development uh, and acceptance uh, is provided by the agreement, uh, this is the specification for the safety of oil transportation. It's also a regulation on the safe transportation of uh, natural gas. Uh, the technical uh, provisions uh, defining the safety of pipelines and also uh, specifications for the processing of, oil, of uh, coal. Uh, the appropriate authorities of the uh, Union also will uh, pass several other international agreements. But uh, this is a medium-term objective. There will be an agreement on the forming of uh, common markets for oil, oil products, gas, and a common uh, energy market that was already mentioned. Passing on to the issues of uh, developing international collaboration with the European Union, I've already raised some issues that are well known. Those are the uh, Energy Charter Treaty, uh, the um, third energy package, and in the contents of uh, the presentation made by the first speaker who presented the position of the European Union, I would like to comment that it was quite correctly noted that uh, any investment project in this area uh, demand very high investment, and it is necessary to provide f and guarantee of the protection of investors' rights. So the third energy package allows to redistribute uh, the flow of energy within the European um, market in a smoother and faster way. As, However, as for the external importer, uh, it is obvious that their rights are not so well guaranteed, and that is in breach of uh, international agreements on the mutual protection of investment. Probably um, that is the conceptual basis for this discrepancy of opinion because the European Union, as we understand, presumes that uh, the EU, um, EU uh, laws prevail over international laws, which include bilateral agreements on the investment protection. We believe that certainly the priority should uh, be with the international law and bilateral agreements. Uh, I wanted also to mention the competition that was very much mentioned in this area. Well, this um, actually the competition should not be seen as an end in itself. Uh, creating a competitive market is only a tool for achieving certain goals. 
uh, competition for competition's sake is not something that can provide a balance of interest in our fuel and energy sector. And Uh, because uh, this market is the market of resources, and in the situation of shortage of uh, resources, uh, competition for competition's sake might drive prices up, including uh, the prices of, for transportation of such resources. So it's difficult to say what benefits, apart from political benefits, will be achieved by the full implementation of the third energy package if that happens in all the member states of the European Union. For Russia, it's very important in these conditions, given the sanctions applied to Russian uh, oil and gas producers, it's essential to uh, look for alternative ways of maintaining international collaboration. Uh, those ways are known. That is collaboration with China, Turkey, with Asia Pacific countries, with the Middle East and Central Asian countries. <coughs> Apart from that, sanctions policy dictates the necessity of taking measures to replace import, including uh, that in uh, oil and gas industry, reducing the Russian dependency on foreign equipment, and we are actively working on that. I would note, if saying very briefly, in conclusion, I would like to note such areas of international legal collaboration as the implementation of the Yamal LNG project, the eastern uh, route of gas export, and also stating the rights of the Russian Federation in the Arctic and in the Caspian region, which will certainly give new life to the production of hydrocarbons in these areas. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, George. <coughs> well, I don't know. Our time is coming up. I, actually, we don't have any more time. But if anyone wants to say something in conclusion, then uh, let's take one minute. Thank you. I would like to say that there was a question about the uh, lawsuit. Yes, the uh, Article 39 and four, Article 40 describes the competences of the European Court, and I believe that at the level of legislation, uh, we could solve the problems of the supremacy of this or that law. And if you come to the site of our Department of Energy at EU, and we do all the work uh, concerning the open public uh, bidding procedure, we started uh, the tender on the development of a common oil market, a common gas market, so the participation of professionals is quite possible through the uh, tender or through the institutions that will be winning those tender procedures. Thank you. Does anyone else want to say something? Yes. Thank you very much. It was Alexander, our moderator, was absolutely right when he said that the energy right is being actively developed. And uh, given uh, the provisions of the agreement on Europe, Eurasian Economic Union, we can say that uh, we are talking about a further development of the energy law of the Eurasian Economic Union. And those provisions that have been formulated and set in that document, those regulations of the Eurasian Union will certainly seriously impact the formation and the further development of uh, the energy order and law in the world. Thank you. Well, then I will summarize briefly. 
we've been discussing for two hours the issues of harmonizing uh, uh, laws of EU, uh, Europe, Eurasian Union, and Russia. We've just identified the problems. More than that, I'm quite positive we did not identify all the problems that really exist. And each of those is a subject for many hours of debates in, if we are to develop a mutually acceptable decision. And those are not theoretical issues, those are very practical issues of which uh, have uh, very practical results. Uh, so our uh, objective is to come to a common denominator and uh, to mutually beneficial collaboration. The conclusion that I made concerning the necessity of involving appropriate experts to the development of uh, Eurasian Union law. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, that you invite us to collaborate. Secondly, we would really want to take European experience into account because uh, Europe was forming, has been forming its uh, single energy market for dozens of years, and they understand uh, the space and time needed to develop those regulations that would be uh, really effective. We want effective uh, uh, laws and regulations in the Eurasian Union, not just dormant regulations. So we would like uh, the Eurasian Union to take European experience in account, including the antitrust, European antitrust laws, because the issues of uh, antitrust regulations will be extremely important uh, for the investment in the issues of cartels, uh, the disbandment of vertically integrated uh, con uh, companies. We're all heirs uh, to the Soviet Union, and we have very strong links, but we will have to work very str um, strenuously on antitrust laws. We shouldn't set impossible tasks. We shouldn't set impossible dead uh, deadlines so that our documents would be living and efficient documents. And of course, as Victoria Romanova quoted the president, uh, this uh, union is built on a mutually beneficial basis, and we would like Russia as a country that transits the energy resources uh, to find uh, the uh, legal solutions that would be very mutual for all the participants in the newly formed union. And we hope that the energy dialogue between Russia and the EU will be resumed in the nearest future, and all the issues and complications that exist now will be removed. And I believe Roman said that as soon as the political tension goes away, all the collaboration will be resumed. We can see a tendency towards that even now, so we need to continue working on those legal issues to be prepared and to be ready to integrate and uh, to obtain benefits from collaboration and the legal regulation as a mechanism for the implementation of those agreements is of, has a special role in that process. Thank you, everyone, for participating in the roundtable. See you at the next meetings.